Well, hi, everyone. This is Carly Vigna here for episode 270 of At Percussion. Today with me, as usual, our co-host, Casey Cangelosi. Hey, Casey. Hey, Carly. How's it going? Good, good, good. How are you? Just doing fine. Thanks. All right. Um, ben Charles is here. Ben, how was your how was your virtual percussion day? It was awesome. I was I was very concerned actually at first that it just like wouldn't work out, but we we normally do an in person event here for percussion day. Um, but we did it virtually this year for obvious reasons. And I was telling Carly before we started that if you've never performed music live on Zoom, definitely test your audio settings ahead of time because mine were not working at all an hour beforehand, but we got it all figured out. And uh, my couple students played great for SPET. Uh, it was really cool to, it's the first time I've ever actually had my students play for my teacher. So it was cool to see that and got some great comments. That's awesome. Have, have you played with uh, OBS, open broadcast software before? I know what that is, so I'm going to say no. Yeah, just that's the end all be all. If you're going to live stream anywhere, just do it through that. That's what everyone does. It's free. It's like works so good. And, it, and there is a way to go through Zoom. Wow. I didn't know about that. Judging by Xenia's face, she didn't either. That's homework. <laughs> That's homework face. Okay, I got homework. Yeah. He's yeah. dropping some knowledge. This episode yeah. is off to I, I'm the founder of this thing. I, I, <laughs> I, yeah, I'm the oldest. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> well, of course, Ksenia Komjanovic is also here. Uh, Ksenia, what happened in, in history on our release date? It, it should be February 4th. Yeah. Hey, Carly. Um, so, uh, a birthday and two death days. Uh, one is Alice Cooper, our great friend. It's his birthday, born in 1948. That means that this man is young. He's very young. Um, then there is one more, which is gonna be sort of relevant to our conversation today, I hope. Um, and that is the uh, death of Yanis Xenakis. So we're not really sure when he was born, but we do know that he died on February uh, 4th in 2001. And then uh, lastly, in 1983, Karen Carpenter, uh, American vocalist and drummer, um, who you know from the Carpenters duo, uh, she died of um, the consequences of anorexia and um, heart failure um, at 32 years old. Um, and given that this was, in, I mean, sure, a couple of big things happened, but not too much in music. I just did a little bit of research about the carpenters because I've never really looked into them that much. And I thought it was really interesting. I remember seeing her drum solos, but I never listened to the band. And then I uh, looked up um, what happened to her drumming career. And it turns out that because she was just five feet, four inches, that's uh, 163 uh, for you Europeans. Um, it was difficult for people uh, in the audience to see Karen behind the kit. So after reviews complained that uh, there's no focal point of the band because I guess her brother being on keyboard was not interesting enough. Uh, they asked her to step in front and just sing solo. And she always considered herself to be a singing drummer and not really to be a singer, even though she had a spectacular voice. But she eventually had to work through her fear and anxiety, you know, performance stress to be in the front because that's what the band needed. And in fact, that's when the band really uh, took off. So she said that she initially really struggled uh, singing solo, but that they hired another drummer and that that's when the band sort of had its its high points in their career. So she was the one people watched and that's uh, Karen Carpenter. If you haven't seen her, you should go look up. She has a fabulous uh, solo where she runs around the stage and plays a lot of really fun stuff. It's really colorful, just beautiful. Uh, go check it out. And uh, that's it. Back to you, Carly. That's it. Hey, that's pretty, that's pretty good. Actually, backing up, I didn't know that we don't know exactly when Zanakis was born. Yeah, that's two crazy. year, two year confusion, I think. Interesting. Yeah, Interesting. Beethoven too. Right. I knew that I would have thought Zanakis is recent enough that, you know, things are more documented, but it's, it's um, Romania. And because it's my part of the world, sort of, I can say that Can we cut this out? That was awful. I shouldn't say that about. Yeah, that's terrible. Well, yeah, save, it, save us, Carly. Without further ado, I'm very happy to intru introduce to you today's guest, Sam Solomon. Uh, Sam teaches percussion at the Boston Conservatory at Berkeley and also at Boston University. He's the percussion director of the Boston University Tanglewood Institute, BUTI, and the artistic director of the Juilliard Summer Percussion Seminar. 
His critically acclaimed book, How to Write for Percussion, is a really wonderful resource for anyone who wants to know more about writing for percussion. And he has also authored four other books, including the recently published Hitchhiker Etudes, which I'm excited to talk about today. In addition, Sam has also curated two collections of percussion etudes and solos. As a performer, he's a founding member of the Yes Around duo and the Line C3 Percussion Group. He has served as percussionist in residence at Harvard University and as the principal timpanist of the Amici New York Chamber Orchestra. And he can be heard performing the music of Bjork on her soundtrack to the film Drawing Restraint 9. Um, in addition to all of that, Sam was one of our teachers, Casey and my teachers at Boston Conservatory a, a little, a few years ago. Um, so Sam, it's such an honor to have you on. Thanks, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, it's so great to be here and wonderful to see everybody and uh, meet some new friends and see some old, old friends. And, and uh, this is great. Really excited. Well, Teacher, we, we miss you. <laughs> <laughs> We're happy to have you on. Sam, yeah. I thought I thought I'd start out asking you to tell us a little bit about the Hitchhiker Etudes that came sure. out um, just this past year in 2020. What a cool concept. Like I was I was checking it out, seeing the samples on, on your website. Um, on top of being really fun to play, I imagine it really helps students learn to play more melodically on the snare drum. So would you first tell us a little bit about the book and the etudes and the concept and what was your inspiration? Sure, yeah, absolutely. The the um it's a set of 18 etudes. It starts relatively easy, kind of in the um level like a Peters or a Sarone and moving towards levels closer to a Delacluz, something more harder like that. Um, so it, it, it runs the gamut uh, in terms of skill level. Um, and the idea is that all of the pieces follow another piece of music. So it's basically like I wrote a snare drum part for uh, orchestra pieces and piano solos and, you know, jazz, jazz um, recordings and things like this. So and the idea being that yeah, there's Michael Jackson in there, there's Police, and there's Billie Holiday, as well as uh, many orchestra pieces and uh, string quartets and so on. Uh, the idea being that if you have other music in your ear, in your, in your head as you're playing, um, you can kind of draw on all of that information and make the music much more, much more interesting, which is, and the inspiration, as you asked, was, is that's kind of how I tend to approach most music, but especially snare drum music. Um, the snare drum doesn't give you a whole lot by itself. Uh, you really have to give to it. And for me, when I play snare drum music, in my imagination, I've got all this other music going on. It's just stuff that I pull from my musical library that exists in my head from all the stuff that I've listened to over the years. And so when I'm playing a Pratt, you know, I'm thinking about if this was a band piece and this was a snare drum piece to a band piece, or if there were like a, a, a fifes playing along, what would the melody be? What would the harmony be? How would that inform the, um, you know, the, the phrasing? You know, where are the cadences? These kinds of things. If, if I'm playing a Delacluse, I might be thinking about orchestration. Like, is this the strings? Or is this the winds? Or the brass comes in here? And all of that, of course, exists only in your imagination. The audience is not really hearing that. Or they might be, but it's not explicitly so. Um, but I think that it, 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 it it gives you a lot to work with in terms of how to pace crescendos, how to think about dynamics, thinking in terms of color, like orchestration in terms of color, informs a lot of how you would play a dynamic or you know what kind of role quality you might choose, these types of things. And so um, I find them really fun to play because I get to hear in my imagination all of this music that I love while I'm playing them. Uh, but I think that it'd also be informative and, and useful for students to try to get them out of that, just hearing it as a snare drum etude and hear it more as a much more richer piece of music. Yeah, I think it's so great. And thinking about, um, well, I was thinking about the the pandemic and the interesting circumstances we're all in, and I'm sure this might have had something to do with your inspiration for it too, but we all, like, we haven't played together in so long, you know, I mean, it, different in different ways. I know yeah. some people are doing distance percussion ensemble, but for such a long stretch of time, it's like us and maybe some headphones and our pads and things. And so what a, what a wonderful resource too. Um, and on top of that, I mean, even when we're back to normal times and we can all get together and have the hugest percussion ensemble in the world. Let's do um, it. <laughs> yeah. I'm on board. That sounds great. <laughs> but yeah, the, but it's, 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 a, it's like you can play with other people, play with your friends, um, even though you're by yourself. So it's, yeah, it's like a, it's a play along track to, to help you get out of your head and get out of your own little space and your own little pad and into the world. 
Right, right. And learning some of these things that it's, it's hard to talk about sometimes how how to figure out how to phrase on snare drum, you know, but yeah. when, when you're playing along with Michael Jackson, or I think there's some <laughs> Mozart and maybe it's, Dvorak in there. Yeah, it's helpful because if it's if you're thinking, you know, as a teacher, you probably have experienced this, you know, you can spend a lot of time talking about individual details. Do this dynamic this way, uh, you know, balance this this uh, drag that way, you know, you can you can kind of piece together a musical idea. But the other approach is more of a top down where you're thinking about what is the musical product that I'm trying to communicate. And there's all of this information packaged into that, you know, where you can you you hear a certain sound and you try to produce that with your instrument and that automatically will fix a lot of things you know it will, it will fix your time it'll fix your dynamics it'll fix your phrasing because it it has purpose it's like i'm not doing i'm not playing this snare drum etude and doing the right dynamics and doing the right you know my my roles don't sound good because that's what it says and because my teacher said so but it's because I want it to sound a certain way. And if it doesn't sound, if, if it doesn't, you know, if I don't play that right dynamic, it's not going to sound like a, this piece of music. It's not going to sound like that, um, that idea that I'm, that I'm striving for in my imagination. And so that's, that's sort of where I try to point um, a lot of my students and, and, and myself, of course, when I'm, when I'm performing. Um, and I hope these pieces makes it really kind of explicit that this is what you're try trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and you're interacting with the recording, even though it's not a, a live person you're interacting with. Right. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And, and it's not intended to play with the recording, but you can do that in practice. I mean, that's it's fun to do that, even though that's not necessarily the end result. Right, right. Ben, I think you have something. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, Sam, it's, it's such an interesting commentary to hear because like I often think to myself in, in the world of percussion, it's like, you know, like our repertoire includes like Stockhausen and Bach and the police <laughs> and it's like yeah. those are all very very cool great music but also so so different and I, I wouldn't it's one of those things I wouldn't say it out loud but like unrelated almost like they're, they're just so so vastly different and it reminds me of there's I, I think there's an actual quote about this but there's the the philosophy of Nadia Boulanger the very famous prolific composition teacher uh, that basically said good music is good music regardless of the genre like we can just judge it on aesthetically what is there and it kind of explains why all of her students were so different and I'm, I'm just like fascinated by seeing like the the diversity of our repertoire as percussionists but in particular also your repertoire Sam as a, as a player um, and it actually we're going to talk about a composer later that has a nice little quote about this so I'll, I'll save that for later um, and then also I wanted to ask you about a John Cage question but I think someone else has something first was it Casey it was me. Thanks, Ben. I, I was going to just say one more thing about this book, Sam. I think it's so cool that, you know, not only like you can practice, you know, how you want to play with these recordings and you can learn rep this way, but also, I mean, we, we practice so much like with a Met and, you know, the landing yeah. mark with a Met is like this wide. I mean, it's like the same space as snare drum and it's very easy to tell if you're with it or not, but listening to like the Sibelius, the Bach, uh, arrivals are so much wider and th yeah, there's such yeah. a margin at which you can be with them or not and when we do play with recordings i remember when you i got to boss conservatory you made me play you made me play a um a Mahler symphony timpani and you made me play mozart 39 you like immediately this is one of the reasons sam's a really good teacher you like immediately said like okay i see what this guy's good at but i bet he's really bad at this other thing and you're like <laughs> bam like nailed it and so i was like casey mozart 39 we're playing it you got to find these like and play with work recording um it was it was tough but that's like exactly what i feel like this book is doing so well too it's like all these cadences and roll off moments where if you're playing with a met yeah the target area is this big and it's very easy to find it with the recording and yeah. no actual snare drum player in the music it's it's uh the, the margins much wider it's like what a cool utility of that book yeah, it's it's fun. I love playing along and uh, teaching playing along with recordings. But I, uh, for myself in in my practice, and I remember especially when I was a student, that being hugely informative because you it's to learn how to without a conductor, just kind of listening and breathing. Even though there's fermata, and then maybe you have to come in after the fermata on a recording, and just thinking about let me try to get that right because it's going to be the same every time it's a recording. I know there's no conductor bringing me in, but let me try to breathe with this group and try to play with them. And it's and it's really informative and it helps you 
learn how music goes, learn how to breathe and think the way, especially non-percussionists think. You know, that, that was one of the one of the important things about this, uh, the project is I chose a lot of non-percussion music because the kinds of expression and the kinds of conception of time, conception of dynamics and color, phrase, all these things that exists in the brains of, of string players, wind players, pianists, and so on, um, is a little bit different than percussionists. And so if we can get into that you just learn a ton and you, you get to, you get to experience a lot of different kinds of music making, phrase making, time making, and that can inform the type of music that you do even when you're playing by yourself. And I think that's something we specifically need to combat because we train so much like, Hey, you got to do your Porgy and best excerpt. And you got to do it with like perfect time when you're in right. front of the audition panel, like they want to hear perfect time, perfect time. But uh, in, in accomplishing that, it seems like percussionists get bad at this other thing, which is like, yeah, violinists don't have perfect time. <laughs> Singers definitely don't have perfect time. It's a little... yeah, you get to come at it from all angles. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, Sam, to, to change topic a little bit here, uh, I wrote my dissertation on multi-percussion music, and there's that quote from John Cage, percussion is revolution. And... Uh, uh, I discovered the first piece ever written for a multi-percussion solo uh, was John Cage's 27 10.554. And I went to the library and I got a score for it. And I immediately closed the score and said, dear God, never again will I look at this. <laughs> it just looks like <laughs> the most massive, unbelievable like undertaking. And it's also like Morris Poulter has this thing about like, you know, you work so hard. It's like, well, like the crowd didn't love that one. Uh, <laughs> and I found that you actually are one of the very few people in the world ever to have uh, gotten through this piece. Uh, and there's a recording on YouTube of you playing this piece. So I like I, I wouldn't even know where to start. Uh, could you tell us about the piece and what your inspiration was for learning it and where you went with it from there? Yeah, this was this was the um... Uh, the and also, sorry to interrupt, but is that how you, is that how you can say the title? Or you would say, <laughs> well, I I say uh, twenty seven minutes ten point five five four seconds for a percussionist. There we go. I, I believe that's how. Uh, I mean, at least that's how I, I've been saying it. <laughs> um, but it's uh, it's a piece that was the big piece on my grad recital in college, and my um, I made the the choice to do an entire concert of solo percussion with live electronics which after I did it, I was, I was, I'm never doing that again, because the, the, you know, if you go to a show, the, the last two people to leave are always the, the percussionists and the sound guys. And if I had, you have to do both of those together, it's just so much logistical nightmare. I, 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 I really filled up on that. I haven't done a lot of it since, but it was an amazing experience. And I did um, um, a handful of pieces that involved live electronics, some of which were written for me. And I, and I took on this cage, which isn't, um, isn't specifically an electronic piece, but I did it with live electronics because in there are some moments where there are um, uh, there are more articulations than a human can tech well Casey maybe but like m most humans can articulate in a period of time. Um, so you need often electronics or layering or recording or another person. Um, there's a lot of leeway in, in, in the piece. Uh, in general, it's the expectation, he says in the instructions, is that there to be an exhaustive amount of sounds, an exhaustive number of beaters, and just, just all the sounds, you know? Uh, and so, including electronics. There are four lines, uh, and I haven't thought about this in a while, so I'm trying to remember exactly what. There are four lines, one with, with metal, one with uh, wood, one with skin, and one with all other. And so for me, the all other was electronics. Um, I did a lot of sound files and things. For the others, I did a combination of uh, just acoustic sounds as well as um, uh, a lot of processing on those acoustic sounds and also some pre recorded stuff um, for the places where maybe I wanted to do something funky with it or if there were just so many articulations I couldn't get to. Uh, the other thing that's weird about it is that high and low on the staff is dynamic as opposed to pitch. So pitch is not indicated. It's like up is loud, down is soft rather than high and low. Uh, but it's, it's exactly 27 minutes, 10.554 seconds. So you do it with a clock. Uh, and so that was convenient for my, this max patch that I designed. 
uh, because I could just have the clock as part of it. I was looking at the clock and the electronics were looking at the clock and doing the things that I needed them to do at the, uh, at the prescribed times. But it was, it was a lot of fun. It was a huge undertaking. If I ever did it again, I would, I would do it a little differently because it was, uh, you know, just kind of a first, a first stab at it. And I think the, a lot of the electronics for me were a little too prescribed. If you're doing cage, you want it to be more aleatoric, I think. So um, I think there were too many, too much me making the decisions in that performance, which is on YouTube, if anybody wants to check it out. There's actually, I put it up there back when YouTube, you could only have 10 minutes at a time. And so uh, there are three, or maybe I, maybe I put a new one up there with everything, but I think there are three different videos. And there's a, um, uh, I think on my website where I have it, you can actually play all three videos at the same time if you want which is very cagey. I think you would probably like that. Uh, but it's, it's a super cool piece. I, I see it as like an opportunity to try to do experiment and try weird stuff. Uh, and I, I think the cage would probably be down with that as a, as a, as an idea for it. There, there's this like a uh, Mark Applebaum joke when he performs one of his pieces, like now I could, I could tell that actually you, you missed, uh, there was a, a wooden note on the, the fourth page that it seemed like came a little bit early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's impossible to, to, I mean, it's not impossible because it, it's, it's one of these pieces. It's, it's in a period we call um, classic indeterminacy where it's, uh, once he writes the piece, then that's the piece, rather than there being fluctuation of the structure within the composition or in the preparation of the composition. He, he did chance procedures, made the score, and then that was it. That's the end of the story. Um, so yeah, you could say this is precisely 10 minutes, you know, 3.7 seconds. And if you do it a little late, then whoops. But um, I think there's a little more leeway in there than that. Rewind and do it again if you go over. That's how it goes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so I would love to know about um, Xenakis's Omega, which, I mean, you performed the American premiere of. Yeah, so that fascinating. was so cool. So please tell us about that. How did that, how did that come about? How does one get an American uh, premiere? Did was you get to talk to him? What happened? Super lucky. No, I didn't get to talk to him at all. It was, I was in school and the, um, we have a new music ensemble at, at uh, I was at Juilliard. We have a mu new music ensemble called the New Juilliard Ensemble run by Joel Sachs. Joel uh, uh, secured the American premiere and he assigned it to me. And and then I got to play the American premiere of Omega, which is Zanakis' final, final work, which is a percussion concerto. Um, so it was just pure dumb luck and, um, and very fortunate to have done it because it's a super cool piece and it's this little nugget of a piece uh, and it's, it's very, I don't know, it's just, it's very classic, powerful, in your face, Zanaka sound. Uh, I think it's, I think it's perfect. I love playing that piece. It's, that's, that's incredible. I mean, to play and Omega being the last letter of the Greek alphabet and that sort of right. being a premonition to this being his final contribution to composition, but to get to play that, I think that's so fascinating. Um, yeah. It must yeah, have it been just, a huge responsibility. Also, it's it so strange. It's so short. So short. It's yeah. what, like, like two minutes, three minutes long or something, or, or you know, yeah, no like, more than five, I forget. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, it was written, I think he was very sick at the time. It's from 2001, um, or 2000, 2001, I think. Uh, and it's, um, uh, he was, it was written for Avon Glenny, I believe. But I, I think he knew, he knew this was, this was the end. So, Omega. Yeah, that's amazing. Congratulations on that. That's fantastic. Thank you. Well, Sam, I know I mentioned in the, be the beginning that you serve as the artistic director for the Juilliard Summer Percussion Seminar. And from everything that I've heard, it sounds like it was a really wonderful success as an online seminar last summer. Um, would you tell us a little bit about how you have adapted from being in person to online and what the plan is for this summer? Yeah, this summer we're again going to be online. Um, and I, I think the, 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 uh, the 2020 uh, Juilliard Seminar was... I think a huge success. It seemed like everybody really responded very well. I think we all benefited from very low expectations, I should say. Um, but even even regardless of that, the uh, a lot of what we aimed to accomplish, we ended up accomplishing. And the the students were very accommodating about 
certain faculty members having technical difficulties, of course. Uh, um, so it was everyone was being very generous about those types of issues. But I think the things that we try to to offer as part of that uh, seminar came off really well. The the original intention was we're going to try to do as much of the thing that we do in person online. So we're not going to skimp on this. We're going to do all the master classes. Master classes work pretty well. We're going to do um, you know all the lectures. We're going to put on concerts. Um, we're going to do chamber music. That was the thing that was a little bit of a I don't know how, but we're going to do it. Uh, and um, and it came off came off really well. The thing that that impressed me most about it was that the students all got to know each other and got along the way they do in in real life. Um, they would at the end of every day we would give one of them the um, I make one of them the host of the Zoom meeting and then they would just stay up for hours and watch movies and play video games and chat and hang out and they all became you know lifelong friends the same way they would at a normal camp so that that was extremely encouraging because at that point we were thinking how long are we going to have to do this this is going to be a disaster this whole uh, um, you know a generation of kids are, are losing these amazing opportunities but it turns out that that even though it's not as good i probably it's um it's still pretty great and just that social connection being able to share and experiences with people being able to share musical ideas with people um um it's just it was really lovely to watch and we had students from all over the world philippines um you know europe all over the united states and so it was it was wonderful to see that happen well, maybe generationally, they're already kind of prone to having friendships online. It's like and you, you mentioned video games, like gamer culture. I mean, that yeah. seems like a lot of people have met. Oh, yeah, we met on online through this game or whatever, and we've stayed close friends. And it's just, um, I don't know, it, it's amazing how, how fast that has happened. Even my, even my toddler, and he doesn't have a lot of experience or time with a phone, but he will like of course he can navigate on the phone pretty well but also it's funny he'll have like a book like a, you know like an actual book and when the pay the book is over he will swipe <laughs> like he'll try to swipe the physical page it's really really cute It'd be like okay it's over. Wait, is there any more and it'll swipe up it's really cute it's true it's true this this generation they have a lot uh, more tolerance i think than 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 i do <laughs> for being on yeah. screens all the time and and we thought well, we're gonna do this really intense program. They're gonna be on the screen a lot. Uh, a lot of the faculty and the administration at, at Juilliard were worried about screen time issues. I think probably the parents were as well. The kids didn't say boo about it. I, I, in the evaluations that we had afterwards, we said, was it wasn't too much? Was it not enough? Everyone was like, no, it was perfect. It's like, oh, it seems like, like my eyes are bleeding. Are you kidding me? How, because yeah. you know, we're just gonna go you know, flip through our phones if we're not on here anyway, so we may as well hang out and do more, more camp stuff. So, um, yeah, it was, it was really lovely. It was really rewarding. Cool. That's so great to hear. So you, you mentioned that in the seminar, you did chamber music online. How did that work? Did you do yeah. kind of recordings and then edit videos together or, or what? We did, we did a, a combination of a few things. And there are some things that that we've done since the like at Boston Conservatory was all remote this, this semester. And so we had a lot of chamber music. Um, and so we did it, we did it a couple ways. Uh, yes, we did one project. We did, we did three pieces on for the Juilliard thing. We did um, a, a new piece by Paola Prestini that she wrote for us, which was, we did with the sort of everybody record their own thing to a, to a play along track. And then we assemble it at the end. So that was that, um, that sort of early pandemic model. And then we did, um, we did another piece by Wadad Alio Smith, which is a graphic score piece and it's a graphic score piece. So we did it live on zoom. Everybody played together and zoom does all this crazy stuff where it will just kind of decide you're going to be really loud. And now you're going to be completely soft. And now, now you're going to be really loud. And now we're going to be able to hear a couple of you. Um, so the balance. The, the Zoom adds all of this mystery to what's going to happen in the ultimate uh, uh, musical product, which was kind of interesting. And but indeterminacy, it, yeah, indeterminacy <laughs> in the context of a graphic score where there is built-in indeterminacy, no problem. It it it, uh, it takes that very well. So I think that is one thing that we can do very well on Zoom. 
and and the students take really took really well to it because as you mentioned by this point it was july some of them hadn't played with anybody else in in many months and it was emotional for a lot of people to say we're actually making music together live uh and then we did another piece written by uh, nico muley who wrote it for the seminar to be performed live on zoom that was the original intention i think that it, it probably works th this particular piece works better i did it at uh, boston university this fall um in person and um and it works better there because of this balance issue but but one thing that I, that I've learned since is that the balance issue the, the best way to fix that is if you're playing something that's live on Zoom, if you have a piece that doesn't have sharp corners, you know if there's if it doesn't have to be totally synchronized, there's a little more flexibility, more cloudy things or uh, um, uh, more sustained things that don't have to be exactly together. You can do it with a conductor on Zoom and have everybody record their audio on their end. And then you record the Zoom meeting, the, the, the video of the Zoom meeting, and then you take, mix all the audio together and then put it on the Zoom meeting and you've got a live recording of a piece. Mm -hmm. And it actually works great. And we've done that a few times this, uh, this fall at Boston Conservatory. Um, so uh, we're gonna do a lot more of that this, this next summer, those types of things. Um, and as much live on Zoom, because as you know, doing those video put together things, a huge amount of work <laughs> so right. um and it's not i don't think it's as fun i think that the playing together uh man it's just so good it's so good so if we have opportunities to do that even if it's this still like the audio is kind of cobbled together we can't really hear each other uh it still feels like music making it feels like rehearsal so we're going to be doing cool. um probably more of that than not I definitely got over the like, hey, everyone play to a track, play your part to a track, and then we'll stitch it together. I got tired of that real quick. I mean, yes. it, was, it was neat, it works, but definitely these pieces that where, like you said, there's no sharp corners, and maybe there is a little room for overlap. Um, at Beta Percussion Seminar, we did Dai Fukijura's piece, which is a, a similar thing. It's called, it was called Longing from a Fall. Longing from a Fall. We did that at Boston Conservatory this, this fall. Oh, great. great. Yeah. yeah, totally, totally, totally great. And Pius Chang wrote a cool one also that, um, so, no. yeah, even without a conductor, I mean, he really allowed for a ton, a ton of overlap, you know, some 20 second, 30 second overlaps that uh, just it totally turned out nice. That's awesome. Yeah. It's so great to hear all these successful things, the way we're using the technology to our advantage and not as just an impediment or a restriction on what we're doing, which is a great uh, segue into Ben's topic for today. What do you have yeah. for us, Ben? <laughs> Thanks, Carly. So uh, I came across this article in the New York Times called The San Francisco Symphony Plunges into a New World. Uh, and it's actually about, about, excuse me, about a composer that Sam has collaborated with. So we can hear some extra details about Nico Muley, who Sam actually mentioned just a few minutes ago. Um, so just a quick little background on Nico Muley, then I'll get into the content of the article. He was born August 26, 1981 in Vermont and grew up, grew up in Providence, Rhode Island, where he sang in the church choir. Uh, I knew he was young, but I didn't know he was that young in the terms of classical composers. Uh, he started studying piano at the age 10, and he went on to study English at Columbia University. And then after that, he completed a master's degree in music at Juilliard, where he studied composition with John Carigliano and Christopher Rouse. He also began working for Philip Glass as a conductor, editor, and keyboardist at the age 22, and he did that role for about eight years. Uh, and he says he considers himself a classical composer, but does not limit himself from expanding to a variety of musical genres. There's a quote from him. He says, it's essentially like being from somewhere. I feel like I'm very proudly from the classical tradition. It's like being from Nebraska, like you are from there. If you're from there, it doesn't mean that you can't have a productive life somewhere else. The notion of your genre being something that you can't, that you have to actively perform, I think is pretty vile. He's been quite a prolific composer at such a young age with several works for percussion, including collaborating with our guest today, Sam. And then uh, about that uh, New York Times article, I just wanted to read the, the sort of opening of it. SFX Salonen didn't expect to make his entrance at the San Francisco Symphony with a virtual premiere, but it's fitting. Mr. Salonen, a conductor and composer who has branded himself an industry innovator and eager adopt adopter of apps and virtual reality, is taking the helm of the orchestra of the 
the world's tech capital. So Salonen created this group of eight collaborative partners in 2018 when he was first appointed to his post. Uh, and they had an intentionally vague mission. Uh, these eight people include, among others, Claire Chase of the International Contemporary Ensemble, Bryce Dessner, the guitarist of The National, and the jazz singer and composer Esperanza Spalding. Uh, and there are five other, others, obviously, and they were all involved in this work. And so my very quick summary of this piece, uh, Nico Muley exploits the new performance mode rather than succumbs to it. So for example, uh, the article talks about how the mixing board can create this impossible to achieve balance of brass against strings. So he uses that in this work. All videos were recorded at the highest quality. There were no like iPhone videos from people's backyards used or anything like that. And then beyond that, there's a certain visual element that they've captured sort of masterfully. So at the end of the piece, there's this uh, part where Esapeka is walking through the woods in his native Finland, and he sort of reaches out and touches a mossy stone, and it sounds a harp. The, the article says like a sorcerer, and there's another part where he sort of touches a berry. Uh, so the visual aspect of it is, is very much a part of it. And I was kind of like messaged our group chat today because I did all my research on this, and I was like, wait a second there's probably a recording online that I can watch. And there was, so I, I found the piece online and, and actually watched it. If anyone's interested, you can find that recording online. But Sam, I know that you've worked uh, with Nico pretty extensively and I'm assuming there was a, a Juilliard connection there as well. So could you tell us about that? Um, Nico and I actually have been friends since, uh, I got this picture here. I'll just throw that there. Um, since we were we were babies, uh, we were at we were at BUTI together, the, the Tanglewood Institute um, when, I think this is like, this is like four, 15 year old Nico. And that's like 17 is, year old. Is Sam. he the one with the super red hair over there? That's <laughs> look at my hair. My hair used to be this color. Um, if a, yeah, uh, that's what fatherhood will do to you. I hear you. Uh, but, but yeah, just wait, just wait. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I think I'm there, Sam. I don't know, man. I think you got, there's still well, room to grow. Um, we'll but Nico and I, yeah, Nico and I have known each other since we were we were quite young, and um, he was actually one of the first composers I ever got to interact with and, and collaborate with. And um, being at such a young age, you know, at this point, I was not familiar with any sort of contemporary music except for percussion ensemble stuff. But that didn't seem like these are people who are living composers who are here it didn't like it didn't it didn't stick at that point because i was still very young and didn't really get it and then when i started going to buti and actually working with composers it's like oh these are these are people they're kids my age who are writing this really cool music and i can play it and i can actually interact with them and did you, and, did, uh, you have that real, did you have that realization that i did a long time ago like oh composers don't have to be dead yeah <laughs> yeah and it's a, it's an amazing thing because what what's I mean, for me i mean my favorite thing to do is to work with work with composers and you know beethoven doesn't return my email so i mean these guys are are such fun and um and nico is super fun and brilliant and I learned a ton uh, from him just in general as a musician, as a percussionist, but also through my collaborations with him and 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 other other people that I met at BUTI. But then, of course, yes, we we went to Juilliard together, um, and we stayed friends through that whole process. And and um, and even as early as this summer, he, he's we're still collaborating. So, um, yeah, it's it's uh, that that relationship has been really fun and really really valuable to me and um, and he's got tons of great percussion music, not just that he's worked with me on, but many other percussionists and tons of great music for other instruments as well, including this, this uh, monster of a piece that he did with the San Francisco. You know, one thing that, that I really liked in this article, um, Ben, was Esapekka Salen, and there's a quote from him that says, we are not an orchestra, we are a media house. Um, and it just kind of speaks to the the changing times. Like what, I, I mean, anyway, perhaps outside of the pandemic, we wouldn't be thinking of things this way, but I think about what direction are we going in that that now orchestras and ensembles and soloists have to have this online online content that is so different than just concertizing and playing and being excellent performers. I think it also got, kind of goes back to what we were talking about before all this, like, you don't just like, you know, do a the Beethoven string quartet over Zoom. Like that's not, that doesn't work. <laughs> you have to figure out new ways to sort of exploit the genre. And like, I think that Pius's piece, uh, Unsynced, I think is like super cool example of that, how you can like blur the lines of like, yeah, we're in a pandemic, but 
it, it doesn't have to be crappy just because we're separated by distance. Yeah, there's tons of tons of great music happening through this new medium. Um, it's different. It has to be different. But that but you know, we have as percussionists, of course, we know that it's not about necessarily the medium that you're using. It's uh, it's about the music that's written for it. You know, you people writing great music for pots and pans for a hundred years. So um, so yeah, why not this nonsense Zoom thing? Let's let's make that work. And it's it's happening. Composers are rising to the challenge. Sam, what do you think is the thing that we're going to learn from this? I mean, of course, we're going to steadily, I feel like we're going to steadily ease back into like normal life, just my, my personal opinion. That's what it seems like. But if normal life resumed again tomorrow, like let's just say COVID vanished. And uh, I don't know, do you think we would we would approach things differently now? Well, I think that we can all take more vacations because uh -huh. <laughs> we can we can be in other places and do more of the work that we thought we couldn't do. Uh, when we were away, so uh, I think we can we can spend more time with with uh, and have more valuable collaborations with friends and and family and colleagues and other musicians. I mean, I've met a lot of people uh, uh, over this pandemic that I've never seen in person and that yeah. I probably wouldn't have met otherwise. So it's actually it's actually pretty cool. I'm excited about um, just in terms of education. What kinds of there's a lot of uh, online programs that sprung up last summer that I think will continue to, to happen. Uh, and it's just gonna give more access and, and more exposure to more people in more places. So, um, you know, the, the lag is still a, an issue for actually, you can't say, play with my click, you know, when you're teaching uh, things like this, uh, I miss a lot, but um, there's still so much to be shared in this, this venue. I think we'll all be able to be uh, just living on tropical islands before too long and not have to anyway we'll see we'll see what happens but but yeah i think i think this, this sort of this te togetherness even in this uh venue is is really going to be valuable for a long time for sure cool yeah well that's a nice thought all of us living on tropical islands you know i i think about um something similar when I'm thinking about maybe adapting a piece of music to play on marimba or to play on some other instrument. And I think about if I'm adapting it, I better be able to do something special that's at least different and as good as the original and hopefully, you know, better in, in some ways. And I think about the same thing, like all of all of the things that it sounds like you're doing to adapt, Sam, that you've done with the Juilliard Seminar, and I'm sure at BOCO and BU too, um, is is change, of course different from what we would have been doing if we had a regular old school year and we could all get together in person but really taking taking advantage of the the things that we can the, the tools that we do have yeah that's a great analogy yeah i think that it's it's important because doing it poorly is not it's not an option like this is not an excuse it's just like a, okay now we have to learn this thing and we have to get good at this and we have to get good at this because because offering a crappy product to our students or our audiences you know it's it's not it's not uh it's not acceptable and that's not what we do we do we do awesome stuff we're percussionists we get we get to do all this awesome stuff we'll just do awesome stuff here so so we do right <laughs> Sam, we you know we started with your uh, with your most recent book, and um, ask you a question not about your I don't think your earliest book, but definitely one of the earlier ones. Do you still use advanced advanced rhythmic studies with your students a lot? Because I do, and man, it's it's really really good. Oh, thank you. Yes, I do. I do. And in fact, I teach a class called Complexity of Rhythm, um, Complexity in Rhythm. Did I say of Complexity in Rhythm? I teach that at at Boston Conservatory and at uh, BU. Uh, mm -hmm. which is super fun and I work out of that book. But I am actually working on a new rhythm book and this is more for um, general population where advanced rhythm studies is very percussion specific. I have something that's in the works probably another year or, year or so to, before it's out, but um, it, it'll be a guide that is for all levels. It actually starts very, uh, very low level, a very beginner level and I'm actually with my eight-year-old in this book oh, okay. uh, and goes all the way up to uh, crazy hard stuff. So uh, I'm excited about that. And it's um, it, it, instead of pad stuff, which is the advanced rhythm studies, it works more with vocal vocal sounds, singing and, and counting. And uh, I think it's pretty fun. 
and I uh, hope people will like it. But yeah, more on that. I'll send you. I'll send you guys a sample. <laughs> I would love that. Hey, hey. Speaking of, um, I find myself recently in counting system discussions sometimes, especially with non-percussionists. Do you have a? Sorry, this is like totally surprising you with this, but do do you have a opinion about like, you know, do you like Takadimi? Do you like one Ienda? Do you like Wantalatalita? Do you have an opinion about that? Because I I've, I've kind of feel opinionated about it. I I um. <laughs> Um, I, I don't have a specific, uh, opinion, like everybody should do it this way. I don't have that kind of opinion. I have a, this is what I do. And I think that, um, there, there are things that more people share, like they all have problems, right? There, there, there are all things that it, it's good to a certain point, And then at this point it gets a little stupid. Um, and general, when I find myself singing rhythms, I'm usually not counting. Like I'll use counting to talk about it. Like I'll say, you know, the uh of two is late or something like this. Right. Um, but but um, but when I'm singing it, I'm, I'm just it's like more like beatboxing and, and just right. kind of making sounds. And um, that's more of a musical language to me. But in terms of counting like this sort of descriptive uh, vocalization of it, I use uh, one eanda and um, uh, and I use more of the Takadimi um, Takadimi counting for fives and sevens and threes, gotcha. like Takata and yeah, Tadagita Tom. Cool. So on. Yeah, I, I, I've always, my, yeah, my opinion's all about like what you use numbers for. It's like, like you said, like, hey, you're, you know, you're missing the duh of beat two. And if you're a conductor and you're trying to communicate with your students, like where something is, you can very, very specifically say, hey, you're putting it here. It needs to go here. And if they're yeah. familiar with that counting system, they know exactly what you're talking about and you don't have to write anything down or whatever. But if you're using takademi, 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 it's like, hey, you're, you're playing me wrong. Oh, which me? What are you, what are you talking? What are you... Wait, which me are we talking about? Yeah. yeah well, yeah. I like, I like combinations of, of counting of, of numbers and the sound. So like, for example, I would say one kita, two kita, three kita. Yeah. So, you know, there's ways of putting it all together and it's all in this new book. You can check it out <laughs> cool. when it comes out, which will be at some point. This is all just ammunition. Next time I'm in this argument, next time I'm in a knife fight in the Western at uh, Paytech. <laughs> well, Sam, it's so cool to hear you talk about this because like I've long had this like rant about like in oral skills and in music theory classes in undergrad. I mean, we study the most advanced harmony to the point that harmony breaks and we get into 12 tone music and all. And like the hardest rhythm that we ever study is a triplet, uh, maybe a quarter <laughs> note triplet. And sure. so like, yeah, it's like, how can we, how can we like make rhythmic complexity interesting? And obviously, Quite frankly, most music doesn't actually use that rhythmic complexity that we're going to study, but also most music doesn't contain German sixth chords, but we still study those. So why not like go above and beyond with it? And like one of my sort of like quarantine goals was like, I'm going to, I'm going to get really good at five lits. So I started like making little exercises and etudes for myself that involve five lits. So it's cool to hear you, hear you say this. And I didn't really have a question. I just want to say that like, I, I very much enjoy that idea of studying rhythmic complexity and I was fortunate enough to study, and it sounds like maybe you did too, like uh, Indian music and their their counting systems, and like hearing Casey talk about you know ianda or tateta, whatever. Like in Indian music, a lot of the time you have something that's like uh, that goes over beats and over bar lines, and it's like a repeated pattern, like you know like ta a ka a di e mi e ta a ka a di a mi a ta ka di mi ta ka di mi, where it's like the same pattern that's accelerating rapidly, and it it doesn't really matter what beat it falls on it's it's how far apart or close together the notes are that changes the rhythmic interest so i don't know that was just sort of a ramble but hopefully i if someone got something out of that <laughs> yeah is that all Sriji is... stuff oh. what's that is that all Sriji stuff oh yeah yeah pubular Sriji at unt just genius genius yeah the the uh, rhythm is so beautiful i mean there's so much in in teaching this class i or in preparing the class i get to i get to dive into all of these different different holes of, of fun, funky rhythm that people or composers are doing or performers are doing. And it's endless, it's endless. Uh, and there's so much cool stuff out there and having an excuse to go farm all that and put it into a class has been one of my favorite things. So, yeah. It's so great to hear what, what we have to look forward to from you coming up. Well, thanks, yeah.
So I'm, I'm sure that many of our listeners are familiar with your book, How to Write for Percussion. And I know personally, I've referred a lot of composers to it. You know, you start to get those questions. Um, you know, what's the range of this instrument? Or oh, tell me about mallets. Because it's so inclusive. It's such a great resource. And, and you're talking about notation systems and sticks and mallets, beaters, um, standard techniques, and then a lot of extended techniques on so many different instruments and analysis of repertoire, solo chamber and orchestral works. Um, but if you had to boil it down to a few quick things, what do you think are some of the most important things for composers to keep in mind when writing for percussion? Yeah, you bet. There's um, um, So it's out in its second edition now. The second edition of How to Write for Percussion has um, many, many, it's at over nine hours of um, video and um, of analysis and examples and interviews and performances. Um, and so in the second edition, the, 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 the biggest change from the first edition is the, is the videos. But the other big change is I actually added a new first chapter. Um, because what I found in the process between, there were 10 years between the first edition and the second edition, um, a lot of people would send me, their, uh, send me their music. Hey, I love your book. I wrote this piece. It was really helpful. Can I send it to you? Yes, I'd love to take a look. And, the, and some, of them were, some of them were great and some of them were... Eh. Um, and, but some were interesting where they were, they were good and with respect to all of the things that, um, that I prescribed in, in my book or that I suggested in my book, but they still weren't really good pieces of music. And these were composers that had other, like a piano piece or an orchestra piece or a string quartet that was really good. So if they're good at writing music and they didn't write a good percussion piece and they used my book, then that's my fault. Like I did that. The bad, the bad is the bad is <laughs> totally. Me. So, yeah. um, so you know, I, I'm taking responsibility for being that guy, I guess, in writing this book. So, what is it? And so, I done some, did some collaboration, and I found that there were some overarching topics that um, I didn't talk about in the first edition, which I think are actually super important, more important than everything else that was in the book. So that became the new first chapter. Um, and I'll give you like a little taste of. of uh, to answer your question, I'll give you a little taste of what's in that first chapter, um, and I'll give you I'll give you two things. The first thing that I think is really important and really underrepresented in the way that we think about and talk about um, our sounds and our instrument instruments is this kind of weird relationship that we have with pitch, um, because we have all these instruments that we refer to as unpitched instruments. Unpitched. There's no pitch cowbell has no pitch but of course it's like that's not a thing yeah it does. These, yeah. you know all all sound is made up of pitches some of these instruments have very unclear pitches right Un, or, or the pitches are it's kind of hard to parse what pitches are coming out of a maraca for example you can do it but it's like you listen to a maraca you, you hear it as a ch like a like a noise sound you don't hear it as a pitch a harmony sound a harmonic functioning sound um so i think that's where it comes from this idea of unpitched, but when it comes down to it, many of the instruments that we use, refer to as unpitched actually have a lot of very clear pitch, like brick drums or bongos or temple blocks. Like you play these instruments and you can sing the pitch. It's really clear. So for, for composers, when they're writing music, they tend to spend a lot of energy thinking about their pitch material. Like the pitch material is really important and they're thinking about it in terms of harmony and they're thinking about it in terms of structure and they're thinking about it in terms of orchestration. And then you get these guys in the back of the group producing all these rando pitches that don't make any sense to anything that's going on and it can totally bust up what's going on in the, in the rest of the harmony. Or at very least, it can sound completely out of place. And so there's a lot of percussion music that is, sounds kind of, to me, cartoony. It's just like kind of melodies of random pitches Kind of a vaudeville type of sound and percussion is really good at that but a lot of composers aren't doing that on a purpose they're doing it by accident and so um i have a lot of details about this this range of which instruments are clear or not clear in their pitches and where and how to use them effectively so that it doesn't um it doesn't you know mess up all of the good pitch work that you've done in the rest of your your music, but I think it's 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 useful for uh, percussionists as well because we often don't think about this when we're choosing instruments. Like, how often do you think people m think about the harmony coming out of a triangle when they choose what triangle to use? You know, I think that that's really important. You know, or a pair of crash cymbals. It's like 
obviously there's a lot of pitches coming out of there. But if we think about it as a harmonic instrument, we might want to say, oh, not this symbol, this symbol, because it's actually, it's in tune. <laughs> like yeah. intonation is important, even when you're dealing with instruments that you don't have control over the pitch. Um, so I think that's, that's, a, that's one important thing that I would love everybody to just kind of open their ears to a little more. Well, and Bill Kahn has that whole system, like how he labels the fundamental of every symbol. And he, he showed us this whole thing where he, he strikes every suspended symbol, he listens for the, the, the decay, and when it decays to a certain point, it's like, okay, that's the primary like overtone. And he, he has like a system, he like turns a symbol over and he labels the fundamental, that's E flat, the overtone is, is B or something, you know, he, he has this whole it. selection process. Yeah, it's really, it, I mean, it makes such a difference in the sound. Um, I and that. I guess, yeah, it's, um, yeah, do we want composers to say, you know, suspended symbol in E flat, or do we want, well, or do we want percussionists to like, yeah, no, no, it is, yeah well, I, I have, yeah. I have suggestions about that in the book as well, about thinking cool. about these, these are instruments that you, you, you can easily request specific pitches for. These are instruments that it's not worth uh, uh, requesting specific pitches. And these, you know, it, these are instruments that you can, but maybe it's not worth it, or maybe it's, it's going to be a really giant pain in the butt for the percussionist, you know, and all, all the sort of the, uh, all of the angles of why and why not to do, to do that kind of thing. But I think that that's, yeah, that's one approach certainly is to actually pitch, pitch them out. Sure. There, there's so much great stuff in there for percussionists too. I mean, certainly, you know, for composers, but as, as I've read through it, I found so many just little cool details that like, I would only expect Sam to like notice, but they're really, really good details. Like I remember one suggestions like dear composers, if you just asked a percussionist to, you know, play fortissimo cymbal crashes for a whole minute straight, and their their heart rate's gonna be like crazy, and then like like don't ask them to go play like a pianissimo triangle hit like right after that. That's gonna be a lot more challenging after doing those cymbal crashes. And I mean, it's like as a percussionist, I've been a percussionist my whole life. Like I, I never considered like yeah, that's that that is harder when you have to that's do that. The, so. Yeah, it's the chike forward to Kiji uh, trap, you know. Yeah, right. Yeah. Not preferred. Not preferred. <laughs> Even um, conductors too. Like I remember hearing um, uh, Frank Epstein uh, do a Epstein do a clinic on on symbols, and he said, you know, Seiji I would just start conducting, and he's, you know, I, I Seiji, it takes me a minute to pick these things up before I can play the first <laughs> crash, you know. And so he actually had Seiji Ozawa pick up the symbols, and he said, Seiji, oh, they are heavy, you know. And from then on, like he actually conducted the orchestra differently because of that. That's great. Seiji is a good sport. That's that's. That's a great story. I like that. That's good. Um, yeah, and and so one other thing that I might uh, I might say as a general uh, topic is the sort of um, what I call the dysfunction of the percussion family, um, because we have composers when they think about an instrument family, uh, they think about instruments that that are like each other or that go together. You know, if you think about in the string family, like a like a violin and a cello are basically the they sound alike. They're basically the same instrument, just one of them is bigger. Um, brass is similar. Uh, woodwind's a little more diverse because you got single reeds, double reeds, and flutes. Um, but they all, you play them, you blow through them. It's kind of similar ideas of, of articulation and sustain and vibrato and, and you know expressivity. All these things are very similar among those instruments. And then you get to percussion, which is just this catch-all. It's just this giant pile of a whole bunch of crap that has nothing to do with each other. Um, and if composers use the same mind about, oh, I'm going to write for these instruments in the percussion family, I have experience writing for strings and winds and keyboard instruments and brass. So I'm going to apply my musical language to this percussion world. And it doesn't always translate because it's, you, kinda, you can't say, write for a, a glockenspiel and guiro together the way you would for violin and, and cello. Like that doesn't, these instruments have nothing to do with each other. You don't play in the same way. They don't sound anything alike. It's like a completely different function. And composers don't necessarily know that. Like we know that, but they don't necessarily know that. And this this crops up in particular with multi-percussion setups where you might have a collection of instruments that sound differently. They might have different note lengths or register or pitch clarity or dynamic response. and 
often compo composers will ask for a set of instruments and play them as if it's multiple pitches on one instrument, you know, like playing the setup together, single lines around one instrument. And it sounds like all these, this like random thing, instead of sounding like one musical line, it sounds like three or four different nonsensical musical lines. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, I think that's, that's one thing that, uh, and I have this big fancy chart in the back of the book, uh, which catalogs the similarities and differences of the, all of the percussion instruments that I describe in the book. So you can see how instruments are related to what degree and why um, and um, I, I hope that that is really helpful and informative for composers to understand how to pair instruments and how to not pair instruments. It's funny, the example you gave, it seems like a, like a compositional like challenge, like, can you write a piece where all the instruments begin with G, glockenspiel, euro, <laughs> guitar? <laughs> um, but Sam, related to something you were just saying, uh, I, I wanted to ask, last week we talked to, to Julie Strom and we, we got to the idea at some point about like the percussion specialist and you know and like I went to UNT and Boston Conservatory seems very much the same way from what I hear Keith Aleo talk about where you have you know the marimba specialist the timpani specialist or timpani slash orchestral and so on there's like the the specialist as a percussionist and then Casey like kind of pulled the god card last week and was like isn't being a totalist actually a specialist which I don't know, but what are your thoughts uh, about being a, a specialist versus a totalist? Um, being a percussionist is, is awesome, right? And, and one of the beautiful things about being a percussionist is that we get, to, we get to do all of these different things. And if we get tired of a thing, we can do a different thing. And that applies not only to instruments we choose, but also music that we choose and ensembles that we choose. So if you learn how to do um, you know, um, play marimba, then that's great. And maybe you're like, hey, I'm kind of tired of just playing marimba. You can totally take those same skills and apply it to like, oh, I'm going to play this vibraphone or I'm going to play this drum setup or something like that. Um, and and we also have a lot of all these opportunities to learn all of these styles of music. And you can be a rock drummer. You can be a, an Afro-Cuban hand drummer. You can study Indian music. You can do all this different stuff. So um, it's yeah, to have an opinion about it, I think is a personal one. It's like, what, what is interesting to you? you? You've decided to be a percussionist. You've decided to enter into this, into this world, which is a, a, to a certain degree, it's like narrow in, in the context of, of the world, but in the context of music, it's, it's, it's almost, it's endless. It's this huge wide, um, uh, you know, just array of paths that you can take. And that for me is one of the things that I find most exciting. You can, you can just keep learning and keep um, you keep doing different things. Some people don't like to do that. Some people are more like, I want to learn a craft and then execute that craft at an extremely high level, and that's that's awesome too. You know, for, for some people it's like, I want to learn this and 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 just keep going my whole life. Um, it's really not you know, it doesn't matter. It's all it's all uh, it's all music. It's like no one's gonna die. It's like whatever. Do whatever you want. You know, it's just music. So you may may as well have as much fun as you possibly can. If for that, if for you that means being a totalist or being a singleist, um, then then you know more power to you. Yeah, it's like a, you could ask like that stupid question like who's better, Steve Schick or John Bonham? It's like idiot like that. <laughs> <laughs> My like, those guys. It's better. What's that, Casey? <laughs> Mike Portnoy is better. <laughs> That's the answer. I love these guys. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> but well, uh, we had one uh, Facebook question from Adam Silverman, and I feel like there's that was uh, a, a, that was the, there's got to be a story here. Uh, he says, <laughs> "How is it possible that you consistently appeared every year at both sides of each Tanglewood pan panoramic photograph?" So, <laughs> wait, you know how to do that, right, Ben? Yeah. Oh, okay. Just check. Yeah, we we have so at, at Tanglewood. Um, this is when we were fellows. At Tanglewood, uh, Adam and I were there at the same time, and and um, he's a composer, not a percussionist. Um, and uh, a few people get selected to be on the end, and there, there's risers with the whole, all the students and, and some of the faculty and staff, and they take a big long panoramic photo. This is like pre iPhone, so I guess everybody knows what that means now. But um, at the time, it was kind of a special thing, and then so the people in the end, and then they say, "Go!" and they they run around the back and get to the end. And I think uh, the, the 
the two years I was there, I was I was on the end both times. So all, Thanks, all I Adam. could think of was uh, the, the memories, Adam. <laughs> yeah, all, all I could think of was spoiler alert, everyone. But the end of end of The Shining when Jack Nicholson appears in the photograph on the wall. Oh, what was that? <laughs> My, um, my, my middle school principal and vice principal did that in like, you know, the sixth grade panorama shot. And we all, you know, we got the prints. And I remember with my friends, we were just like, wait, what the f How'd they do that? Like, we, <laughs> we, didn't <laughs> we didn't understand how they did it. Yeah, it's it's like a trick they played on us. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't even know that was a thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, you could try You'll have to try it. Yeah, now I have. Yeah, do it to Back the when we're in person, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One end of the room, but to the other. Well, I think it's been great. Sam, it's been so wonderful to have you on. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's been great. Great to hear from you. Thanks so much. Wonderful to be here. Wonderful to talk to all of you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, right. thanks, Sam. Thank you. Yeah, you guys. All right. Bye, everybody.